Welcome to Patients at Risk. Today, we're joined by Dr. Teresa Camp Rogers to discuss an article that claims that nurse practitioners and physicians are equivalent when it comes to overprescribing inappropriate medications. Well, I'm really happy that you're joining us because if you just read the summary or the abstract, you know, you really think that it's saying one thing, but when you know about statistics and you delve into the actual report, sometimes it turns out that those conclusions are not really what the study is actually saying. So I think you're going to be very helpful for us to figure out what's going on in this study that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. And this was actually published in October of 2023. The name of the article is Inappropriate Prescribing to Older Patients by Nurse Practitioners and Primary Care Physicians. The question that they're asking, I think, is exactly what we all want to know, regardless of the side of the of this debate that we're on. And hopefully we're in all in the middle, just wanting the truth and what doing wanting to do what's right. The question is, are the rates of inappropriate prescribing among NPs similar to physicians? Um, and it's actually a good question. It can fit easily into like the PICO format. You've got your population comparison, intervention comparison and outcomes that compare nurse practitioners and physicians. Here is where there's a critical oversight that affects the validity of the entire study. It, it's basically this fatal flaw is an assumption that occurs at this point. So they only looked at prescribing patterns in states that had independent prescribing. Within these states, we have no idea the proportion of nurse practitioners who have actually elected to work without a physician. And that number has been very closely guarded by, by um, nurse practitioner lobby, because I think if we knew how small the number was after decades of this entire like uh, plan of theirs, I think if we knew that that number was really small, it would seal the fate. They assume that the NPs in these states are not being supervised. And they assume that just because the NPs work in a state with full practice authority, that the majority of NPs have actually chosen to work unsupervised. There is actually a news article from Illinois in 2020, and it gives us a little glimpse of, of how to estimate the total number of MPs that have signed up for full practice authority. Um, so Illinois passed full practice authority in 2017, and this article was published in 2020, and they shared that out of 12,000 MPs, only 400 had signed up. So what the possibility is, is that the majority of nurse practitioners do not want to practice independently. And I would say, you know, we know that the NP lobby and leadership, they don't want that that part to be known. In fact, they tell nurse practitioners, if you're opposed to full practice authority, you need to be quiet because you're undermining our whole profession. Right. So there may be more that just you know, aren't speaking out about it. But the reality is, is the data is indicating that most NPs don't want to practice independently. Right. Which is, it's really interesting. Underlying this whole debate, you could talk about balance of policy and regulation with letting letting the market kind of figure itself out. We're in a position, I think, where because patients' lives are at stake, you know, we can't wait for the market to play it out. If the education doesn't prepare people to work alone, then they shouldn't be able to work alone. And, and that's the bottom line. And, and I don't need most of them to be prepared to work alone. I need all of them to be prepared to work alone. But it sounds like um, over time, it is playing out in the market. If we can have some data to show that nurse practitioners, the majority know it's not acceptable. The majority know it's not safe. This, this was a snippet out of a news article. Um, and I've screenshot it just in case it's ever taken down. 400 out of 12,000 in one state, which is state included in this study, because it's Illinois, um, that's, I think, about 3%. So if only 3% have elected to work independently, then 97% are working in a supervised model. And so when we look forward to the end of this study, we already know kind of the punchline of this study. We're basically studying, does a supervised model work, right? So, so I see of what you're saying. Yeah. So we're saying, does a supervised model work? So yes, we're studying states with policy that says that nurse nurse practitioners can work independently. But the reality is, if we they're look not. at, they're not working independently. So that makes our conclusions different. It has to, you have to understand how practice actually being carried out in these states. It's not the policy that makes an individual nurse practitioner safe. 
it's a policy that allows 12,000 to choose, which is kind of a nice little American principle, right? <laughs> it's, a, um, it's a policy that allows nurse practitioners to choose. 97% said nay, nah, which means that they're working in a supervised model. So the conclusion isn't that nurse practitioners aren't prescribing it appropriately. The conclusion could be that a supervised model actually works. Which is what studies have shown over and over again. And it's always the caveat that's missing when you see these reports, NPs can provide the same care as physicians yep. when practicing under physician supervision or following physician created protocols, which is basically yep. what Cochrane showed. They and they do point out in the study as one of in their discussion that they don't really know which of the NPs are actually practicing truly independently versus who is working in association with a physician. But I think that nurse, nursing boards know that information. I do think that that's something that we need a lot more transparency on. I always bring up the fact that we've had independent practice in states like Oregon and Washington State for, for a really long time, Alaska. And yet we don't see any real data showing whether that unsupervised practice is safe, what the outcomes have been. And again, we don't know how many, even though it's legal there, how many NPs are actually practicing autonomously. We just don't know. So, and as far as I can tell, after reading it, the article doesn't share that information either. When we consider the groups and what they're actually doing, the next thing is exclusions. They exclude a number of different people. They exclude people that wrote less than 100 prescriptions for 65 and older, but you're also going to water down the data a good bit. You're going to lower the risk of finding abnormalities. Right. So if if I'm prescribing a bunch of medications to people over 65, then I'm going to be less likely to make mistakes. Right. Um, you have more experience. In fact, I'd be really interested to know those ones that prescribe less than 100 a year. Are they all 100 completely inappropriate? That could change the data. It could skew the data at the same time. But I think maybe that's maybe that's the next question is what's the rate of inappropriate prescribing among MPs that write it for less than 100 um, people older, over the 65. I think the outcomes are, are they're okay. It's hard, right, to to formulate a question where you get an outcome that, that tells you exactly what's going on. And this is kind of the, the ongoing struggle of science and statistics. And, and, you know, it's this ultimate quest for the truth, you know. But I think that Beer's criteria, you know, they've been around for a long time. They're drugs that are potentially inappropriate. It doesn't mean they're always inappropriate. And the authors do go there. They don't do it till right at the end of the article. And the title doesn't say it either. I was kind of doing a little bit of a word game when I was reading it. I was like, I wonder if this article would mean anything if we added potentially inappropriate to the title. Because <laughs> then we'd be like, okay, what's the point of the article? If we if we said, uh, you know, if we did inappropriate prescribing um, to older patients, that means that it happened. That means that there was inappropriate prescribing. But but that's not really known because the beer's criteria is potentially harmful. Yeah. Not always. Certainly we will prescribe medication on that list because it's the right choice for the individual patient uh, after discussing the pros and cons. They do point out that um, hospice and, and palliative care can be exemptions. And they talked about they tried to carve that out or find out by uh, removing patients that were in skilled nursing facilities and um in different settings, but that, I don't know that you can really, that, that doesn't necessarily mean a person's on hospice or palliative care just because they're living in a skilled nursing facility or a nursing home. I, and I'm not sure that I buy into that, uh, that they were able to, to really rule that out that way. I, I don't think so either. And I'm not sure if there were, I, I'd like to look at the data, you know, I'd like to know, I'd like to be a fly on the wall when those decisions were being made. Excluding them cleans up the data but I still want to see what it was. Does that make I sense? I think that it would be especially interesting because they pointed out, it was so weird that there were more nurse practitioners who either were really, really low on the inappropriate prescribing. And then there were a, a whole bunch in uh, excess that were on the outliers of too much prescribing. And uh, my question is, number one, does that just average out the data? Um, and <laughs> I mean- I, what did you think of that? I, I actually, that was when I was reviewing this last night. Um, I wondered if that shows kind of the, it's like a reverse bell curve. Instead of a bell curve, you got two tails that go up. And I, I wonder if that kind of is a reflection of the education of nurse practitioners. If what it inadvert, what they're inadvertently sharing is that there's a whole group of nurse practitioners 
that may not be safe. And I can't kind of think that might be the, you know, for the, um, hopefully nurse practitioners will take that away and reflect on their own education. You know, the people that are in charge of that. Um, but I think for, um, for all of us to, to, to look at it that way, I think you're exactly right. It seems like that would be an opportunity to really dig into the data, to pull those outliers and see if you can't figure out a little bit more information about who those people are. Are they people with less years of education? Did they go to online training? Are those the ones that are truly practicing independently? We don't know, but what you said is true. This study has shown pretty clearly that there is a subset of nurse practitioners that are significant outliers in more inappropriate prescribing by their criteria, which is by prescribing medications on the beers listing for seniors. Our finding that NPs were disproportionately overrepresented among clinicians with the highest rates of inappropriate prescribing mm -hmm. raises concern about the lower tail of prescribing performance among NPs. At this top level, where people got a really like an A plus, there's a really high proportion of NPs that got an F. Right. Does that right. make sense? But F isn't 60 and above and F, they go down to look at these folks, right? Like they got a zero percentile. Look at the high proportion of people that got less than, you know, 30% on a, as a grade, you know, right. you're thinking. And so um, they're egregiously getting it wrong. But in, and you know, and it's neat looking at, I'm really happy for, I, I, I don't know if you can put this in the podcast, but like, I'm really happy for the nurse practitioners that do get a hundred percent. I would love to know who they are, where they trained, what their model of practice is like, because that's what we need. That top 10%, that's what we need because they're doing, you know, they're doing what we all hope we think, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then the ones and the other extreme, what's going on there so that we can fix that. Yes. That's what this study really, to me says, not just saying, Oh, they're just as good. Looks like uh, independent practice is great saying like, Hey, there's some interesting stuff here. Some people are doing a great job. Some people are doing a terrible job in the end. It averages out, but um, it, average isn't really what we're looking for. We're looking for high quality care for everybody. And so clearly there's some people doing it right. Some people doing it wrong. And that to me is what this study is showing. And that needs to be investigated.